Good evening. This is Montpelier Civic Forum, and we're back. And we're tonight we're speaking to Jim Murphy, who is the chair of the Montpelier Roxbury School District. Tell me, do board it right. Of the uh, the board of school directors. He is yeah. the head of the board of school directors. Jim, how long have you been on the board? Eight years now. And uh, the vast sum that you make for sitting on the board? 1500 a year. And your wife will allow you to do that? Well, I have another job. <laughs> no one's, don't quit your day job, right? Yeah, don't quit your day job. How long have you been chair? Uh, I've been chair since 2018, so six years now. Boy, that's a long six years. It has been a long six years. And um, we're here to talk about the revised budget, the budget yes. that's coming up for a vote on April 30th. Yep. And you can vote ahead of time. Uh, yes, you can vote early. And you can go to City Hall and vote on April 30th, should you wish. Yeah, and you can also request a ballot from City Hall to be mailed to you. And you can also show up at City Hall, I, I think, pretty much any time now and, and vote. I don't know if, if John has the... Um, the ballots ready, but certainly in the next week or two, you should be able to to show up early. And it takes it's one question, so it, it'll take thirty seconds. Now, this is a revised budget. I want to open with the, the district itself. The district itself is for this year. It's Roxbury Village School. It is Union Elementary School. It's Main Street Middle School, and it's the high school. Yep, Montpelier High School. And the um, two elementary schools together will have approximately 415 students. Uh, Main Street Middle School has 378, and the high school has 375. Yeah, uh, we have 290 employees, of which 161 of them are teachers. And we offer a full curriculum, yep. including AP courses. Yes. And basically 13% of our student body, which is holding constant, is special needs. Yeah, that all sounds right. I mean, I think those figures are from our website, and so those sound. Now, our challenge is to arrive at a budget that, that everyone will agree on. Yes. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And what I want to do is I want Jim to give me just an overview. How much are we talking about? What is the total budget amount that you guys are asking for? We're asking for about 30.5 million, uh, which was down from original request that, that was voted no of 32 million. So we've reduced that by about 1.5 million. What does that mean to a house? Uh, it will be a tax increase in Montpelier of about 14%, which is down from 24%. And I understand those are very high numbers, and I'm going to explain why. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Uh, in Roxbury, I think it's a slightly under 4%. Okay, price. before before people start to shut off the television and say this is totally unfair, would you explain how it's equal, how 4% equals 14%? Uh, it largely has to do with um, the CLA, which is the common level of appraisal, is, is very different in both towns, which is, that's, and, and because Montpelier went through an appraisal, there's this phenomenon that, um, that I think has gotten the attention of some people in the state where there's, there's, there's basically a property tax bump um, after an appraisal happens. You, you know, levels out, and then the next year, uh, you get the common level of appraisal it seeks to uh, basically take what the appraised value is and, and make it as close to what you could get it if you actually sold your house. Um, because Montpelier is a very hot market um, and because we realized the, the leveling effects of the appraisal last year, um, Montpelier got a bump of about kind of 13% baked in in terms of uh, and, and across the board increase. And there are more properties that sell in Montpelier than in Roxbury, yes. so it's easier to set that new benchmark. Yeah. So that at some point in time, Roxbury will go through this same experience and they'll experience yeah. a bump as well. A bump. Maybe not as significant because, you know, I'm the... The, the market in, in Roxbury is, is not as hot as it is in Montpelier. Right, and, and never will be. And probably never will be. So basically, 
lost in the din of the last election was the amount of work that actually went into shaping that budget. I mean, it, it kind of focused on two elements. On one case, oh my God, it's 23%, and on the other, where do you stand on the Roxbury Village School? Yes, and well, how, do you, how, do you, how do you get that number down when? But how do you get to that number is, is equally yeah. interesting because it was not arrived at lightly. I mean, every year the board goes through an extremely detailed process yeah. to try and get to that number that they feel is appropriate in order to educate. First of all, does this budget contain any new programs? No, this, this budget is, is a actual substantial cut compared. It's, the, the first budget we put out had some cuts in it. Um, but was relatively kind of a level budget in terms of just moving the same program before. This has this has positions eliminated and the closure of a school. So it has it has cuts that are pretty significant. But there's nothing in addition hiding in the budget. Absolutely not. No. Um, I want to take you back to November and even before November. Yeah. Talk to us about Act 127 because it plays a big role in this and I realize to a lot of people it's just another state act. What was Act 127? So Act 127 effectively, you know, Vermont has a very Byzantine education funding mechanism and it, it, that came from the- Compromise. Yeah, it came from compromise and it came from a, a decision Brigham, if my memory is correct, back in the 90s, that, that essentially said that, that Vermont had to come up with a way to ensure that there was a quality in school outcomes. And um, so... A quality in school outcome that wouldn't be different in the NEK, that, that ex yeah, because that, you lived in a very property poor area, your kids wouldn't suffer uh, and other kids benefit because they're growing up in Killington or stuff. Exactly. So, uh, you know, prior to that in the 80s and 90s, if you were in a town that had a relatively, you know, decent property tax base and wealth base, like like Stowe, like South Burlington, like Montpelier, uh, you know, there was plenty from the board to draw on in terms of, of local taxes. But, you know, for property poor towns like the Northeast Kingdom and some other rural towns, uh, they had very little property tax to, to, to draw on, and the schools were very poor. So the outcomes, the educational outcomes were, were huge. And the, the Vermont Constitution, as read by the Supreme Court, guarantees equality in education. So they forced upon the legislature the need to, to equalize that and, and to redistribute funding. So we start to pool funds from the locals. Yes over to the state and then back to the locals again. Exactly, so there's this, there was this you know, education fund set up and it's distributed equally based on what was previously called equalized pupils, um, which is, was a formula that looks, it's not kind of the number of, of people in seats, but it's, it's those people with weights on them according to essentially according to their education needs. <clears throat> what is an education need? Uh, it's not, it's not uh, Gabriel's bad at math. It's, it's more fundamentals than that. It's, it's yeah. socioeconomic? It, it's, it's socioeconomic factors. Uh, a big factor is um, whether or not English is a first language or a, a second language. Um, special needs. Special needs. Uh, Th those type of factors, uh, and also like where they are in the in the education. You know, it's it's not the same cost to do a first grader it is is to do a junior in high school. So, so all those factors are weighted, and it, it comes out with a number, and that number basically determines you get a set amount called the dollar yield that is based on that per pupil number, and that's distributed to schools. What was Act 120? I think we were in favor of Act 127 we, we, on board. So what Act 127 did was it, uh, there was a study that came out of UVM that effectively said that the weights that, that were being used were not, were not actually accounting for actual education need. 
uh, and that there was, was inequity there and that the weights needed to be shifted. Um, and then it proposed a, a mechanism to shift them. So the legislature adopted 127 to effectively reflect that UVM study. The effects of that, I mean, the, the positive effects were, were that it did a better job of allocating resources. Uh, and that's why the board supported it. We, we have our community values equity, the board values equity. Uh, the result is a good one. Like, the more money should go where the, the needs are. Uh, Montpelier, however, and Montpelier Roxbury District was not a beneficiary of that shift. At what point did we learn that? We knew, we knew at the onset that we would not likely be a beneficiary. However, we, we felt that, I mean, the board felt in supporting it, that it was still the right thing to do from a statewide education perspective. I'm not sure, well, I, I know we didn't understand how Act 127 was really designed, and, and, and I, by what happened to the legislature, I don't think the legislature itself understood how Act 127 was originally designed. But we picked up some better weighted students in Roxbury because the community is less affluent. We actually than we are. didn't because because of because there was a previous act called Act One Forty Act Forty Six that that gave certain incentives for districts to merge, and because of the way our district basically because because of of that and also because of kind of the the ratio of, of Roxbury to Montpelier, we did not we did not get the role advantage of Roxbury students, even so, though other places in the states that, that had similar education challenges to Roxbury did. So in November, we're starting the budget. Did we know at that point the kinds of, of, of cuts or, or the, the diminishing of resources that Act 127 we, would would bring. We learned. We started learning in early November. the The communication from the agency of the of education to school districts about what all this meant. We knew it was out there. The communication was very slow in terms of what all this meant. And then when it came, it came kind of in the middle of the fall, and it came in very draconian fashion. And um, that's when we learned that cuts were going to be, or, or the, the, the impacts of the Ed Fund from this were going to be pretty substantial to our district, and not just to our district, but statewide. Now, in December, on December 6th, yeah. you have a come to Jesus moment, and you say to Libby, we've got to look for cuts. You know, this is serious. We've got to explore our options. Yeah. What brought that about? Well... You know, in Act 127, the, the legislature went and fixed it. Originally, it had, you know, so, so the, the education fund is, is a pie. And so it, it moved the way the pie was distributed, you know, from here to here, from, you know, where it previously was to, you know, districts that under the new formula had more needs. The legislature tried to have it both ways. It, so it, it created this, this cap on impacts to local property taxes uh, in the in the first iteration, to you know blunt the effect of districts like Montpelier that were going to lose a lot of weighted students and thus a lot of of money from the state, basically saying for five years we will kind of the state will use the education fund to not only shift money to these districts that that under the new weighted formula have higher needs, but also to backfill the money that a lot of districts are losing. What it did was it, it, it started to tank the Ed Fund very quickly. So the, the per, pupil, per pupil dollar amount going to each district went from 15,000 in our last budget cycle to by the time the legislature fixed it, it was, it was at about, I think it was like under eight or, or so thousand. So it, it almost halved the amount of money that was going to districts is because it spread the Ed's fund so thin. 
So in, December, in November or December, you discover, my goodness, this is real. Yeah. Now, at that point, you're telling Libby, look, look for areas that can be cut. Now, yeah, and, and Libby is, is telling us that, that this is serious. This is serious, yes. Um, could you talk about the reserve? Because at that point, you're sitting on a fairly sizable reserve. How, how do we build a reserve like that? What, what's the size of the reserve in December, uh, the approximate size? So and I think how do we build it? I think the approximate size was about 1.5 million. I don't have the chart in front of me. Libby did a good job of walking through it. I think it was around 1.5 million or so. We have to keep approximately 2% um, per policy in place. So we either it was either 1.5 and we had you know 1.25 or so at our discretion, or it was or we had 1.8. But we, 1 .8 but we, we decommitted. Oh, what, 1.5 from the track. Where, where was that at that point? Isn't that part of the reserve? That was, yeah, that was a big part. So it's bigger than 1.5 yeah. million. Yeah, I think it was maybe 1.8 or 1.9. Right. Yeah. So we're sitting, how did we build that reserve? Is it just cash that um, we, is it operating? Is it, what, what is it? So it's, <laughs> it's basically, it's money that we budgeted for and didn't spend for whatever reason. Uh, I think there were a, a variety of, of reasons that, that it was built up. One, I think during COVID, there were a lot of expenses that just weren't incurred, that were normally incurred, that we budgeted for. Um, we also had a very good but very conservative budget manager for several years who, if a position could theoretically cost us 100,000, he put 100,000 in. He was not gonna say, we've got a 75% chance, this is only gonna cost us 80,000, which some budget managers might do. He's like, look, if, if this could cost us 100,000, let's put 100,000 in the budget, so we're not caught with our pants down. And if it doesn't cost 100,000, we're in a good position. And if it costs 100,000, we're not scrambling for money. Um, so between, I think, COVID and conservative budgeting, it was, you know, there wasn't any huge windfall. It was just a lot of, you know, this, this teacher, yeah, this teacher took a single plan instead of a family plan because we budgeted for a family plan because it was theoretical. So there's 30,000. And, um, you know, this, you know, this program ended up not needing to spend all of, all of these funds because, you know, whatever happened. So it was, you know, so chunks of money started coming back into the reserve. Oh. So you're trying to avoid staff layoffs, yes. I assume. Now, at this point, are we talking about um, teacher buyout? My understanding is that, that you know teacher buyouts have been been offered, uh, and it was it was definitely I think a, a a tool that was looked at as a way to avoid yeah staff layoff. So and we have we have natural natural retirements and people, you know, otherwise leaving positions. Which... Now, what's going on at the legislature at this point? I mean, they're realizing that they've got a problem. So the, yeah, they're so scrambling. The, yeah, so the legislature is realizing they've got a problem. When he, when he first crafted the budget in December, we crafted it with this cap in mind. That, okay, the cap being, one more time explaining the cap. So, so, the, so, so the original Act 127 was that as long as you had Per pupil, spend, per pupil spending that did not rise more than 10%, your local taxes were capped at 5% pre-CLA. So it was 5% and then whatever the CLA boost was. How do we get to 23? <laughs> uh, well, what happened is we, we had the 5% cap, and then you know, our CLA brought up, originally I think there was like 18 or 19 for, for Montpelier. Uh, what happened was the legislature realized that the cap was draining the Ed Fund. So in February, it was February, early March, they got rid of the cap. So that's how we got from 19 to 23. Talk, there, there's one more out of your control. Yeah. Talk about health insurance. Yeah, and then health insurance, well, health insurance. You know, I mean, the, the budget, our, our previous budget was 28 point something. 
you know, which up to 32. So when you say oh, it's a level budget, that doesn't look like a level budget. It's a level budget in terms of we kept all the services level. Uh, we had two major cost increases. One was um, at about a million dollars in benefits increases because our, our health care costs went up 16%, uh, which was, you know, health care costs tend now, to... Now, that is a state plan that we're... That is a state plan that, that we are locked into. Of. Yes, we're, we're members of and locked into. Uh, we also, and this is consistent with what most of the school districts around us did, um, and very well earned. Our, our teachers are, are fantastic. Um, we were on the second cycle of two kind of major salary increases that were, were pretty large. That was, I think, another seven or 800,000. So, so we had about two million baked in in salary and benefit costs just to keep our, retain our existing staff. Now, if you're doing teacher buyouts, then you've got younger teachers to buy in and basically to purchase their services and you're bidding against other school districts. So pretty much I assume that the teacher raise to some extent is defensive in order to allow us the flexibility to get teachers to bid successfully against other districts. Yeah, no, we have to stay. I mean, even with those those increases, because I, I, I know that, you know, uh, it might sound like a lot of money to some people. We are still, for Central Vermont, we are in, like in the middle of the pack in terms of teacher compensation. So we are, we are competitive, but by no means, by no means the highest paying district, even in Central Vermont. And then, you know, we're also competing with Chittenden County, which, which pays more. We're, we're up to January. And we've got the decision uh, to keep the Roxbury Village School in the budget and um, basically to use surplus money in order to try and drive it down to 23%. Well, we didn't originally, I mean, the original budget, we used some surplus money. I think we used about five or 600,000 in the original budget. Um, and then we. We phased out a few positions, um, and then we kind of did did a haircut on a bunch of things. On you know, like the the school, uh, each school's um, just kind of general spending budget. Um, you know, I think we we kind of pared down some some maintenance and facilities. So three hundred seventy five thousand yeah worth of a haircut yeah, and then two hundred thousand of facilities. And thirty thousand to athletic equipment, and eighteen thousand to technology. Yeah, and some of the, some of those were added onto the original budget, but but we had, you know, we had cuts. We had cuts in the original budget. I think of about half a million or more, beyond what level spending would have been. Can we get into some of those personnel cuts? What did we? What are we losing in this budget? from what we have at this day in April? Um, I don't want to get too into personal cuts because it, it kind of goes goes to position. But um, yeah, I think library aid, we lost a, you know, a literacy coach, um, some instructional assistants, um, you know, some just general support staff. So, so those type of reductions. Did we lose any programs? We did not lose any programs. Um, so basically, the budget that you're proposing right now is smaller than the other budget by about a million and a half. Yeah. What is that million and a half cut? What What are we losing for a million and a half? What's What's the haircut? I mean, the the biggest the the biggest reason for that was is the closure of the Roxbury Village School and, and sending okay. rocks sending right. all all right. rocks. Sending the Roxbury Elementary students to Union Elementary School next and year. we'll be able to then pick up some of that in the reserve fund. Well, by doing that, we were able to um, not have to go deeper into the reserve fund to get to a lower tax rate. What is the reserve fund at right now? Approximately, I'm not asking for. Are we still over a million dollars? 
I, I would have to check that. I think, I think we're slightly below a million dollars for next year, which gives us, I think, some, or maybe right around a million, um, which gives us some room to Did use we have to hit the reserve fund um, to work on Montpelier High School after the flooding? No. Okay. All of those expenses were covered by insurance. Oh, okay. That, so that we, we we got very fortunate with um, we got very fortunate there. So right now we're staring at a budget that you guys don't have a plan. This is Plan B. Is there a Plan C if this goes down? Uh, I, I think you, you, you know, we put out some budgets that brought the, you know, proposals that brought us to more like 12, 11%. Um, it starts to get, it starts to get really painful, I mean, both for families and, and for education. That's when you're talking about cutting, I think, more deeply in, into programs. Uh, you're talking about cutting things like Busing for UES, uh, which I know would put a lot of strain on families and raise a lot of safety concerns. Uh, you're talking about bringing our facilities maintenance down to, um, you know, just basically what's needed for safety, uh, which may save something over the next year or two, but then you get delayed maintenance and then those things become much more expensive to fix later. Um, so, so if, yeah. If, if we do have to go to a third budget, it, then you're, you're starting to really, I think, erode the quality of the schools. The state allowed your board to reopen the budget. Yeah. Uh, other boards did. <clears throat> we didn't. Why didn't? What, what was the thinking behind not reopening it? I, the thinking was that we felt we had put out a very responsible and reasonable budget. Uh, we had not done what some other districts did. What some other districts did and is... You know, they saw that 5% cap, and this is actually one of the reasons that, that the, the, the cap backfired, I mean, in terms of you're trying to spread it too thin. But, you know, some districts looked at that 5% cap and said, oh, this is a great time, since the state's paying for it, to put projects that we might otherwise bond uh, or pay for for another revenue source into our general budget. And as long as we're below that 10% per pupil cap, we can just... We can just rock it up to that ten percent per pupil cap. Put in a bunch of pet projects. We have that five percent cap, and the state will pay for it. So when the cap went away, I think districts that did that had to reopen. And had to reopen and say we have to take all those out because those are going to go to our taxpayers now. Um, you know, we. Yeah. Yeah, we 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 felt that. Really, other than than moving the Roxbury students to Union Elementary School, there was not a lot of wiggle room for us to reduce our budget, and without hitting a bone, without hitting a bone, and you know the the feeling on the board was that that move for the Roxbury community was something that we wanted more time to consider. Right now, the legislature realizes that they've, they've got a problem. Yes. What do you as a board, I mean, Libby is in constant contact with the Superintendents Association, probably with our delegation. Yeah. Um, what is the feeling on, on how that readjustment that's inevitable, it will be something, how it might impact our future budget, not this one, next year's budget. I mean, I think we're going to be in a, a better place next year. I, I think the by getting rid of the cap, uh, the legislature saved the Ed Fund from freefall. Uh, so I think next, I, I think next year there's going to be three factors that will will make it. I don't think it's going to be a, a walk in the park budget. But I think a, a much easier budget without the type of impacts we have. One is I think the Ed Fund will be will be stabilized. Um, two is we've already taken the the adjustment for the per pupil count, um, so that formulaic change has has occurred. Uh, that's it's one now the, baked in. It's now baked in. So uh, so our per pupil count will be 
the second year under the same formula. So it will be relatively similar. I mean, it, we might lose some, we might gain some, but it's not going to be the dramatic shift we had where we, we lost a, a considerable number of, of weighted pupils under this new system. And the third is, is that, that CLA bump that we had from the reappraisal is also baked in. Is also baked in. That's that's. I mean, there probably will be a little bit of an adjustment there, but it's not going to be that that draconian thirteen percent. So, those three factors are all in our favor, and I think we'll make for a more stable budget next year. Stable meaning, possibly ten or under. I would certainly hope we are ten or under next year. I mean, I, I, um, yeah. I, I realize 14% is, is a lot for folks. 24% was, was obviously too high. Uh, I, I hope we can get to, I don't want to make promises about numbers, but certainly below 10%, I, th I think, would, would be a big desire. And, and I, w I would love it to be considerably below 10%. You've been on the board long enough. Uh, we're not talking about weighted pupils. Now we'll talk about pupils. Yes. Uh, do you see more pupils, fewer pupils, uh, roughly the same number of pupils? Well, Montpelier had the advantage for the last several years of being one of the few towns in the state that was gaining pupils, and that appears to have stopped. We appear to be in um, the newer classes coming in are are starting to see declining numbers. So. We have a nice bubble going through. Um, we do not seem to be having students at the number that, that we've seen them over the last really five or so years. So, so yeah, our, our student population appears to be entering a period of, of, of decline again. So the school board has its eyes set east to Sabin's Pasture and beyond that to Country Club? I mean, this is where, yeah, this is, this is, <laughs> You can't control that. I can't control that, but it's a conversation we need to have because you know the, the school boards and I think the conversation about education needs to be put in the context of other conversations. You know, housing in Montpelier is, is very tight. Um, and, and there's two types of housing we, we, we don't have. We don't have. We don't have starter homes that young families can afford. And we also, like honestly, don't have... Um, you know, the types of home that empty nesters and retired Montpelierites can, can downsize into. Um, so we've got... And we don't have enough apartments. And we don't have enough apartments. And we don't have enough multifamily units. Which, and, you know, right. multifamily units are also oftentimes great places for, um, you know, for empty nesters and, and, and seniors to move into. Uh, they're also great places for, you know, for young families to buy, to live there three, four years, get some equity, move on. We don't really have much of any of that. And then we have, you know, then we have a, a income property tax adjustment that, you know, and, and I think right now it's it's a humanitarian thing because we don't want to chase people from their homes, especially if they don't have options to go. But we have people who, you know, are, are not making the income they made you know, when they were younger, who were able to, to stay in homes that really could accommodate five or six people, and there's one or two of them in there. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of empty bedrooms in Montpelier, um, and, and not a lot of places for people to go. I want to talk about the physical side of the district for a second. Yeah. Um, Union Elementary, structurally sound. Union you know, Elementary is a great school. Main Street Middle School. Main Street Middle School has, it keeps chugging along. We've, we've done a good job, I think, of, of, of maintaining it. It's, um, it's bursting at the seams, and, and I, I don't think it's our flagship building. The high school, hydraulically, after the flood, what is going on? Uh, what was are, the damage that was sustained in the flood? So most of the damage was to the basement. We, we got incredibly lucky. What do we do with that basement, Norm? What were we doing with that basement last school year before the flood? 
It's it's largely where like the heating units are okay. housed, and there's some storage. There was no instructional going on there. There was no instructional. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so how did we get lucky in the basement? Uh, well, we got lucky because it stayed in the basement, and I mean, obviously, it was a big cleanup job in the basement, but um, insurance largely covered it. And if if it had gotten to the first floor, I I think it would have been unlikely that we would have been able to start school on August whatever, you know, 20 whatever. Are we, we studying school. how to keep it from hitting the first floor in the future? We are, we are. And we, where is the progress on that? What's the time frame? Well, I, we're hoping for a report, you know, I think relatively soon. We've commissioned um, uh, a firm that does engineering, that does architecture. Uh, they've they've done some some community uh, processes, but but they're taking a look at kind of what what the options are for that site and that building. So you'll have a whole series of public hearings again on those options. And well, we'll certainly put them out. Um, you know, you know, Montpelier is is land constrained. There's, there are not a lot of places to put a major high school that that are available, um, and except for Country Club Road. <laughs> yeah, and well, and we're I, not going to do that. Yes, yeah, and, and as you know, that that uh, that's a you know a, a different. Golf, well, it's, a, it's also a golf shot away from U thirty two high school. Exactly, which get some people's attention. Um, this is your chance to explain the track. When is the track going in? What is the track? And basically, what are we getting for four hundred thousand dollars? So, you know, the the board originally um, set aside a, a, por a, a good portion of the reserve to update a track. We have a track from 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 hell. Yeah, we have a track from nineteen seventy two that yes. looks like a track from nineteen seventy two. Um, I understand this was controversial in the community. Uh, I, I think I think we have to have a little bit of soul searching because I think in most communities the track we have would be unacceptable. And well, what are we getting? What what will, will the new track look like? And, and so how we're not getting we... we're not getting a new track. So we we oh, okay. uncover that fund. Um, what we're doing right now is is we're making investments in the current track to essentially make it safe. It's, it's in very poor condition. Uh, so, How did the flood affect that? And, and would the next flood affect your, your version of the track, your uh, new version? Yeah, the, the flood, surprisingly, you know, that field was actually well designed to drain. The, 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 the flood did not do a ton of damage well, that's good. to the track, which is good. It's, it's more the fact that it's you know, 52 years old. Um, and and just has not been, had maintenance or upkeep. Yeah, it's had maintenance or upkeep. So, so we are we have set aside up to four hundred thousand dollars to to do that maintenance and upkeep. Um, Will it be ready for the next school year? I'm not sure exactly when it's going to be ready. I mean, it's 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 not ready now. Um, and I would have to talk to Andrew Larosa, who's the facilities director, about when exactly. I mean, I think they are planning to do work on it. You know this this construction season, uh, but it will be it will be the same track, but with improvements to make it safe and functional. So the bottom line on this budget, which you hope to pass, is that it's a responsible budget. It's a very responsible budget that took a lot of deliberation. the The board worked incredibly hard on this budget that required compromises that were extremely painful, particularly for the people in Roxbury. Yeah, no, very, very painful. And I, I, I want to, you know, stress the, you know, the impact on, on the Roxbury community. I mean, I have full faith that we will transition those kids to UES in a way that, that will be. Will they be welcome? Will they be welcome? It will be passion and kind. I think they will all get an excellent, excellent education. Uh, you know, Roxbury is a is a small, tight hit community that's really trying to to rebuild and revitalize. Um, you know that school is, is a centerpiece of that community, and to uh, to make a, a major decision about that school as quickly as we did 
uh, was was both hard and um, yeah, it, it, I don't think anybody wanted to do it this way. At the same time, the board recognizes that getting that rate down to 10 or below is really a priority for the board, yeah, if, it, get, if at all possible. Getting it down to 10 or below, uh, we also heard a lot from the Montpelier community that, um, yeah, from, from a, a purely educational perspective, that was the place where we could make the most significant cut that would have long-term impacts, that would be a, a long-term savings, and get the, the tax rate down to something more reasonable. Uh, and I think, I think the Mox, Montpelier community was, we, we got strong signals that, you know, people voted for the budget for, I think, a variety of reasons, but I think it was clear that there was a substantial portion of the Montpelier community that, that really felt strongly that, that, that we could not afford to continue to educate our elementary students at, at two elementary schools. But at the same time, the 23% was a hard pill for everyone to swallow. It was a hard pill for everyone to swallow. And that the for good reason. It's a high number, and and people are people are stressed, and uh, yeah, we're, we're we're not the only place prices are going up for folks. Right, right. But the fourteen percent isn't the board doesn't see that as a new norm. No, I really see that as a result of two things, which I think are both short term. One is one is the CLA bump, but I think the other thing is 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 the adjustment. On, of Act 27 in terms of our weighted peoples. And, and both of those are not going to be present next year. Jim, I, I wish you good luck. And again, I'll tell you people that get out and vote. You know, yeah. you might be for this, you might be against it, but let's, let's weigh in. There are schools, it's our tax rate, and I would encourage you, as I always do, to yeah. get out and vote, encourage others to vote. And I thank Jim for appearing on Montpelier Civic Forum, and I thank you for watching it.